For almost 20 years, the Sonic Amateur Games Expo has given independent developers a platform to reach a massive online audience. Originally focused on fan games and elaborate hacks for Sonic the Hedgehog, the event has since grown to cover a wide range of platforming titles. As the event has become better known year on year, there have been a number of genuine breakout successes from Sage. This year's indie darling, Pizza Tower, got an initial demonstration at Sage 2019, and a number of well-known developers cut their teeth at these events, like Lake Feppard, who'd go on to create the Spark the Electric Jester series, as well as the developers at Headcanon, who would lead production on Sonic Mania and Origins for Sega. To get a glimpse at platforming games you'll enjoy in the coming years, and the talent responsible, Sage has become the best place to start. But passing through so many demos can be a challenge, as is finding something to gel with your tastes. So as I've done on this channel previously, I'd like to champion some independent creators and their works from this year's Sage event. Like Alien Xenocide, Captain Wayne and Anton Blast, these are all titles made by teams in the single digits, who have taken influence from both popular and esoteric games, and elevated them with their own creative identity. Some of these projects are original works, whilst others riff on established franchises. A few were built in Unity, although considering recent news that probably won't be the case next year, whilst others have struck out with less popular but still as robust development platforms. But ultimately, each is a hot cider core title, and I'll be using reference points of other games covered on the channel to explain why I like them so much. I'll also be providing some constructive criticism where possible, because these are all demonstrations I hope can be improved on. Links to all these demos will be in the description below, as well as social media accounts to stay up to date with development. Without further ado, here are my top picks from Sage 2023. This year's event glowingly represented almost every era of Sonic through fan projects, with some going as far to creating their own new spins on the Hedgehog. There was one title that presented itself as a lost 32x era Sonic game that reimagined the character in low fidelity CG, whilst on the completely other extreme end there was another that visually matched the recently released Sonic Frontiers. In between there were titles that built on Sonic Mania and Sonic Rush and even one that reimagined the character in cel-shaded CG to give him a Cartoon Network vibe. Although all these demos were fantastic, my top 5 picks unfortunately do not feature Sega's mammalian mascot. Ironically, the three games I've picked as my favourite fan projects have almost the exact same genre in common, because each reimagines their properties as puzzle platformers. Instead of just being obstacle courses to an end flagpole, they were little challenge rooms to overcome. Granted, all of them also bent the rules of expected arcade action, expanding the scope of what solving a puzzle can look like. Bob's Big Blowout, for example, reworks the concept of Taito's 1986 game Bubble Bobble by turning the titular Bob into a digital spelunker. The demo initially won me over with its Wizard of Oz style transition. Initially, you're playing a standard round of Bubble Bobble, presented in a single screen 2D platform section. As expected, Bub must use their bubble breath to stun enemies ready to be kicked off the course. But then our pudgy protagonist walks through a hole at the bottom of the frame and emerges into a fully 3D world. Like the 2D platform sections of Super Mario Odyssey, even shifting the music and art style like that game does, Bub's Big Blowout is an excellent magic trick. Fortunately, the fun didn't wear off across the rest of the game. The concept's nearest point of reference might be the first Pac-Man World game. There, Namco also needed to shift a character once known for being a 2D arcade icon into a 3D platform star. Without the transitionary Super Mario Bros games that Nintendo's mascot had, the developers behind Pac's PlayStation Adventure found more additional means to balance both expected Pac-Man gameplay and new platforming. Levels were broken up into small bubbles of content, like mazes and obstacle courses, with the camera angle shifting to best present each challenge. Pac-Man's movement speed and jumps are kept digital, so he controls the same throughout each activity, and so the shifting angles and gameplay types don't overwhelm a player. Bob does similar. When solving a classic bubble bobble challenge, it looks and plays as expected. But when Bub ventures into the 3D world, the vibe shifts into a top-down Legend of Zelda title. 
exploration becomes key, because it's now about seeking out those TV sections, every enemy, and even extend letters to fully complete a level. The developer has a lot of fun with the concepts, with one level featuring locked doors that must be opened by completing challenges, and another where platforming moments turn into chase sections. All the while, controls don't change, meaning no confusion when swapping between activities. One cool feature added by the developer is that Bub's bubbles can be used as temporary platforms. Although it took a few moments to figure out its timing, I could use the bubbles to skip some platforming sections in a satisfying manner, and it'd be cool if, in the final game, these bubble platforms could be used to get secret items for super players. Overall, the game promotes a sense of wanting to explore that all great platformers do, and it's been little hits of content like the chases, locked doors, and even bubble platforming that get my mind racing on what else could be added to this concept. According to its credits, all modelling, textures, programming, and music for Bob's Big Blowout were done by a single individual, and considering the final quality of these facets, that's incredibly impressive. Bob is charming to look at, and there's even small details like puffs of dust as he runs and even changes in his expression throughout the game. These are features that even the big developers forget to implement, let alone single independence. If that wasn't enough, this demo even features three additional characters to play as, all with their own different physics. Bob's big blowout is easily one to watch, especially to see how polish is applied and ideas can be further developed. Miles Fox understands what makes great 3D games from 2D ideas, and I hope to see more unique concepts applied as this demonstration develops into a full release. An adaptation of an older Flash game, Super Mario Star Scramble DX could be described as the missing link between Super Mario Bros and Mario vs Donkey Kong. From the latter, there are locked down puzzle rooms that require objectives to be hit under a time limit to progress. But the expected look and controls of the former obstacle course style Super Mario games has been implemented. Outside of switches that change the opacity of blocks, there's no contraptions to be used to change the shape of environments. Instead, this is all a challenge of dexterity, by cutting the fastest route through objectives back to a level's entrance. Those objectives to be hit are shine sprites, with often four hidden in a level to be collected. In that sense, Super Mario Star Scrabble DX could also be considered a 2D Super Mario 64. Although there's a time limit in place to focus attention, these shines are placed in a similar way to that game, or require some level of interaction to make appear. It includes a similar whimsy to 64 or so, and despite the demo having one tile set almost entirely the way through, Star Scramble has plenty of fond concepts at play. There's even one level that takes influence from Tetris. Star Scramble even includes optional objectives to complete to get the highest score on a level. These extra tokens are pink squares that brought to mind the Natromi logo, which is a nice segue into speaking about the visual quality of this demo. Like Natromi's work, best seen most recently in Shovel Knight Dig, Super Mario Star Scramble DX features richly animated sprite work to a quality that it becomes pixel art. These are not redesigned sprites from other games, but instead completely custom assets throughout, with a consistent and high quality style. The music also evokes classic Mario themes, but with the developer's own flair. This is one of the best looking Mario fan games, and it's appreciated that it's paired with a Mario game that's unique to play. I'd also like to add that its menu interface is lifted from Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, which leads me to believe that developers have a very good idea on what makes a great Mario puzzle game. I have very little criticism of this title, and I suppose it's because it's a reimagining of a game that was already well conceptualised. I would like to see, though, where the developers could further expand on the concept. As of right now, this demo only ports over the original handful of levels from the Flash original. In brand new levels, perhaps they could start to port in more puzzling elements from both Donkey Kong 94 and the rest of the Super Mario Bros series. As it's already so well defined on its own identity, It'd be cool to see how Star Scramble could further become a missing link between two distinct flavours of Super Mario. From one demonstration with eye-popping sound and visuals, to one that on the surface is simple in its aesthetics. Of course, you shouldn't judge a bug by its cover, and I'm glad that I stuck with Chapter Zero of the Angel Island Saga because it upended all my expectations in the best means possible. Based on its title screen and Sage description, 
I had imagined Chapter Zero was going to be an exercise in fanfiction. Although the final demo does build up a story that takes place long before Sonic the Hedgehog, it doesn't attempt to imitate the gameplay of that title. Instead, and what was its most pleasant surprise, was that Chapter Zero was a Master System take on Super Smash Bros. Break the Target's game. Presented as a series of warrior's trials, players must clear obstacle courses as quickly as possible, through platforming and use of their special moves. Like Super Smash Bros, the playable Orange Echidna can attack in multiple directions and jump, and when pressing the special move button in conjunction with a direction, can cast a number of unique magic spells. These all have utility in target breaking also, like a lightning beam that passes through walls until it hits an object, at which point it moves directly up until hitting another target. These are all of limited use and must be replenished with a limited resources throughout levels. Despite taking place in ancient echidna lands, there are a lot of fun mechanical tricks and traps employed throughout levels, from robotic combatants that must be destroyed to open the way ahead, to even pressure switch puzzles that require a player to remember and input the correct sequence. These traps and the quirks of special moves make levels fun to replay for better times, as you become more aware of what can be achieved, and like the original Break the Targets game, it's all a training exercise for being a better combatant. This combat prowess has paid off a little bit in later levels that play out more like conventional platformers, even featuring boss fights that turn the bonus stages of Sonic 1 into aggressive entities. But the juice of Chapter Zero is, so far, these break the target challenges. In the full release, I happily played dozens of them to see how new mechanical flourishes are introduced and then made more challenging throughout. More enemy types and interactables would also be fantastic. But if the one is to go in this more combative direction, an obvious suggestion would be looking at the rest of Super Smash Bros for inspiration. Perhaps there could be enemies or even additional playable characters with their own target breaking magic. Where other Sage developers have looked to improve on older Sonic concepts, I appreciated that Chapter Zero moved to the beat of its own drum. That even extends to its look and sound. Although it could just be a gag that a game that canonically takes place before Sonic the Hedgehog looks like a Master System game, something about its visuals put me very much in the mindset of titles like Load Runner, where graphical hardware wasn't powerful enough to render side-scrolling worlds. So instead, playable characters were made small and levels were single-screen mazes to navigate. Although not the most appealing character nor tile set, Chapter Zero at least is incredibly functional. Background colours never blend with the character's orange coat, and platforms are always strictly delineated by greys and whites. Especially when so many fan demos overcompensate with too much art, the Spartan approach here ends up being smarter. Musically, familiar tracks from other games have been recomposed to a Sega sound font, and the choices are all solid picks. It'll be fun to see how Zero develops as new chapters of the Angel Island saga could be added. And for now, this is one of the few titles that is actually worth revisiting in the pursuit of better times and becoming a better Echidna Warrior. Pizza Tower got its initial wide demonstration at the Sonic Amateur Games Expo, long before becoming massively popular in its own right. Much like Sage has encouraged fans of Sega's Hedgehog to make their own Sonic adventures, the popularity of Tour de Pizza's game and the burgeoning Wario-like movement has now inspired a number of new demos referencing his greatest achievement. The best example at this year's Expo has to be Susan Taxpayer. Swapping out pepperoni and sausage for paper clips and staplers, the demo sees the titular Susan Taxpayer navigate an office obstacle course in a similar fashion to a white collar Wario. In this brief level, her objective is to get to and grab important paperwork, before huffing it back to a level's entrance ahead of a countdown timer. Like Wario Land 4 has a frog switch and Pizza Tower has John Pillar, Susan Taxpayer has a sentient briefcase sitting on a chest of drawers to flip a level from exploration to evacuation. This motif is grey, and Susan herself is an instantly likeable character. An MS paint pastiche of Elaine Benes, she channels the same manic likeability of Pepino, Anton and Wario, without feeling like a cheap photocopy. Stylistically, Taxpayer takes further inspiration from Seinfeld, Windows 95 and corporate clip art to style its look and sound, populating levels with breakable paper stacks, 
and sentient potted plants for Susan to tear through. As an early demonstration, there are places Susan Taxpayer can and hopefully will improve. Using SMBX2 as its development platform, programming wizardry has been employed to make Super Mario World feel more like Wario Land 4. Running and jumping is familiar to the former, whilst the latter showed a barge is here to give Susan a burst of speed. Even technology similar to Pizza Tower has been employed, like air boosts and floor bounces to gain and extend heights. It's all incredibly clever stuff, though in this demo there is a feeling a clunk I'm anticipating will be polished out, based on development videos on Twitter and YouTube, that seems to be the case. Blasting through levels isn't quite here yet, but the platforming is still fun to engage with especially when it factors in environmental destruction. Two, I hope some additional frames of animation could be employed to make Susan's squash and stretchy movement even more appealing. Like its points of inspiration, Susan Taxpayer is a great start that I expect will get spit and polished to its underlying gameplay. I also hope that the concept of a white collar Wario Land can be fully explored. 2020's Going Under, a satirical dungeon crawler about exploring failed tech startups, feels like a natural companion here, turning big business paraphernalia into goblins and obstacles to overcome. Regardless, Susan Taxpayer is shaping up to be more than just the average 9-5 to platformer, and I'm excited to see how she develops at her next review. Last, and certainly not least, is my favourite demo from the entirety of Sage 2023. That said, Sandro Gomez certainly has plenty going for it. Developed in partnership by studio Seller Chateau and Sonic Mania creators Headcanon, Sonova's story is shaping up to be an enormous hit. In fact, it's the only title I've played that already has a Steam Score page. To give the blender pitch, imagine an 8-bit adventure that combines Castlevania, DuckTales and Super Mario Bros. 2 with Dash as a Cave Story. Sonjo is a funny animal-led adventure set in rural Mexico, populated with manic machines and plenty of treasure to plunder. Sandro is of a piece with Shovel Knight, built with a similar intent of creating the best possible NES game that can exist this side of the year 2000. A retro title in its aesthetics, but gameplay is sharp, and there are none of the flaws you'd expect from an antiquated presentation. In fact, in spite of what its visuals might lead you to believe, Sonova Story is one of the most robust titles I've played in some time. This demonstration features three, technically four characters, all with completely distinct gameplay. Sandro, the wandering musician, is a Simon Belmondo that uses a whip as his main weapon and collects abilities to expand navigation. For example, angel wings unlock extra jumps to get to higher levels. Unlike the Belmonster Castlevania also, there's no nasty knockback from enemy attacks, making navigation all the more appealing. His partner, Juana, has a gun with recharging ammo that can upgrade to more fearsome forms. Not only does this give her a more ranged combat style, that gun can also be used to navigate specialized platforms activated by his shots. Finally, there's Spike and Basalt, whom players will face off against as bosses at the end of Sondra's gameplay. Their design evokes Eggman's henchmen from the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, and their robotic bodies have a lot of fun functionality. Unfortunately, I didn't get too far into their abilities in this simple demo, but there's already lots of potential from their moves. Basalt's drill, for example, allows navigation through soft dirt, while Spike's propeller neck allows easy access to other platforms. No matter which character is chosen, each feels fantastic to control, avoiding the expected clunk of an NES presentation. Outside of collectible treasures and sub-weapons, Castlevania's influence might best be seen by the constantly changing shape of platforming. There are horizontally moving levels where all platforms and perils are on screen, but some doors lead to Mario Bros. 2-like climbing sections where these characters navigate ropes to move through vertically scrolling sections. It's really great to see both styles at play, and it's a great differentiator from something like Shovel Knight where level navigation played out almost always across a single axis. It keeps the camera steady, and also leads to fun 8-bit gimmicks like standing in the top UI when climbing out of a level. In general, Sandro Gomez is an incredibly well thought out title. Sprites and sounds are both period appropriate, but very much bunch above their weight. Character designs are also very appealing, and I'm even interested in seeing how this tale told from three different perspectives plays out. 
the game is presented in the style of an old theatre production, and that concept is built out further in the rubber hose look of some characters and the turn of the century plot of simple farm folk looking to strike gold. The high standard of work headcanon proved with Sonic Mania is apparent here, and I'm keen to see what they and Cella Chateau can do with Sandra Gomez. With a tentative release date for next year, perhaps it won't be long before we see the rest of their Sonova story. And there you have it, my top picks from 2023's Sonic Amateur Games Expo. As always, if you'd like to suggest any great games you played at the event, or would even like to shout out anything you worked on, please let me know in the comments below. Also, if you've enjoyed my coverage of games from this event, let me know if there's any other fan projects you'd like me to cover in future. If and when they hit a final release, I'll make sure to catch up with all the titles discussed to see how they developed. But until then, I've been James, and I'll see you all in the next upload.